I must admit, I listened to the honorable orator that preceded me with a lot of interest. I will, as I go along in my intervention, address the issues that have been raised by him. I prefer to park it, if I may, for a few minutes and call upon him for his patience, since I'm sure he wishes that I address certain of the points raised by him. However, allow me to address the House, Mr. Speaker, to start out by referring to the background as the honorable ministers who have spoken and the honorable members who have spoken before me have rightly said. The background and the context of this budget is of utmost importance. Yes, we are living through historical times. And it is the way we react and the way we act in the face of those challenges that will determine whether we are to be congratulated by posterity or whether we are going to be condemned and thrown and sent to the gallows. That is all what it is, if I am to simplify it. It is not a question of government to use to use a terminology that is very often said used in Creole taplestoma or risdra upon itself and tries to look good about everything it does, or even the opposition just constantly <coughs> criticizing. That's not neither here nor there. But I think it's important at this stage to remind the government side that it is indeed the right of the opposition and the duty of the opposition to shine the light upon the lacunas in what government is doing. It is not incompatible with our function. We are duty bound to, shine, to shed light and to show and to show what this government is doing wrong. That is the duty of all opposition. It is clear that some members of government are very allergic to criticism when in fact it is our responsibility as elected members of this house. I go even further, it is also the responsibility of backbenchers to draw the attention of government of where it is going wrong. And if at any stage of its governance, government is seen to be totally confused with the position that it will hold on any subject, it is the responsibility of all backbenchers on all sides of the House to draw the attention of government to the wrongdoing and lacunas and to force them and make them, convince them in a democratic manner to bring changes. This introduction that I've tried to make is in fact follows the remarks of Honorable Orator that spoke before me, Honorable Nazwali, because it seems that there is somehow, someplace in his words, he is drawing attention to the confusion that government is in. He is indeed drawing attention to the wrong interpretation of the law of a minister of this government. And it takes a lot of courage on his part to at least speak out and say that there is wrong that is going on in government. And I note, not in between the lines, he has said it without any doubt and without fear or favor. So for that, I congratulate him. He is the only one who has had the courage to do so. I see that his colleague next to him has been passing him a few papers. I hope that he also is together in this, in this adventure of being courageous to state out loud what you believe. This is a first in the life cycle of this government, and I'll get into detail in a few minutes, and we will see at the end of the day whether you deserve congratulations and whether you'll be able to stand up to what you've tried to indicate to us. So, Mr. Speaker, When one starts out by looking at the background, and I have to refer here to important 
factors, the background, Afrobarometer study. And this is what the Honorable Minister of Finance, bizarrely, makes no reference to in his budget speech. He does not tell us that according to the Afrobarometer study, and I read the report dated the 20th May, 24th of May 2022, that two-thirds of Mauritians say, 66% of Mauritians say that the country is going in the wrong direction, representing a 16 percentage point increase since 2017. That is also part of the background. 66% of this country believes that this country is going in the wrong direction. It says that more than 6 out of 10 Mauritians, 6 out of 10, 63% of this country consider the current economic situation either very bad or fairly bad. A 26 percentage point increase since 2017. Now you cannot therefore, Mr. Speaker, say that things are getting better. Now if the government want to octocrine congratulate themselves because they feel they are doing well, I pause here for a minute to advise them, humbly so, to at least consider what the views of the population are. Do they believe that you are doing things well or do they believe that things are getting worse? That is why in, on this side of the house we have often invited members of government to get off their pedestal, to climb down their ivory tower that they seem to be so comfortably perched upon and to be connected with the people because when you look at the title that the Honorable Minister has chosen for this budget with the people for the people there is nothing further from the truth nothing further from the truth it, it cannot be with the people for the people when the Honorable Minister of Finance comes out and ignores the fact that there are statistics out there, surveys out there, that says that almost two-thirds of citizens expect that the economic situation will worsen in the next 12 months. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I think it is important to be able to concentrate my intervention on issues that deserve to be brought out into the light. It is important for me to be able to explain to the people that the lies that have surrounded the economic argument and figures and facts need to be shown in their true light. The maneuvers, the Machiavellian maneuvers of the Minister of Finance I do not believe that they are politically honest. They are devoid of any political honesty. That also must be brought to the attention of our people. Let me start out by what he is offering. And he likes to auto-congratulate himself by saying that this government, and he tries to encenser le Premier Ministre, in both languages, since he is very good at both of them, Molière and Shakespeare, and he encensé le Premier Ministre by saying to him, it is all thanks to you, sir, that I have managed to come up with this budget. Without you, there is nothing. Without you, no one thinks on this side of the house. Without you, there are no ideas. Without you, there is no vision. We are nothing without you. You are on your own one-man government. This is what he says. Et ce qui peut faire encore plus rire, ceux qui l'emboîtent le pas. Et lui disent à chaque fois en conclusion ou au milieu de leur discours, au début, qu'il faut encenser notre cher Premier ministre pour s'assurer sûrement de l'investiture aux prochaines élections. Mais laissons ça de côté, côté pour un moment. So when he says that he is giving 1,000 rupees to our elderly as from the age of 60 
and 65 another thousand rupees one thing which i would love him to answer as uh, i believe in my humble view a very important question that i believe he should answer is why is it that he did not give any increase in pension to the elderly in 2020 why is it that oh yes there was no increase you see you yourself don't seem to be aware and that is quite worrying my my dear minister the minister of finance is not even aware that the orphans the widows the old age pensioners back in 2020 were not even given a compensation increase that you have to get at the end of the year december 2020 no compensation was given to widows why no compensation was given to orphans why nothing was given to the old age pensioners in 2020 why in spite of the fact that it came immediately after the huge promises that were made during the election campaign of 2019 let me go further and let me interrupt the thought process of the honorable minister of finance for a little second and ask him mr speaker sir to answer the other question why is it that nothing was given to orphans in terms of compensation in 2021 why is it that nothing was given to widows compensation in 2021 nothing was given to the old age pensioners in 2021 why is it sir that nothing was in the offing for those categories of the citizens that today for the first time after an absence of two years he says that they deserve the government's help did they not deserve your help in 2021 did they not deserve your attention in 2020 why were they forgotten does any other minister on the other side of the house have the answer to that i hope so because no one has addressed this issue at all so if they were forgotten in 2020 and they were forgotten in 2021 and on average they should have obtained at least 500 rupees in 2020 they should have obtained 500 rupees in 2021 and in 2022 the least they should have obtained is more than 500 mr speaker this government owes our old age pensioners widows and orphans money they are owed at least 500 rupees in terms of increase in those allocations it is their due it is their right that this government has robbed unless i am given an explanation le moment doit arriver quand l'honorable ministre des finances doit trouver le courage avec la facilité qu'il a de s'exprimer en français de venir dire à nos citoyens ceux qui ont 60 ans ou ceux qui ont plus de 60 ans pourquoi le pourquoi de l'oubli en 2020 pourquoi les avoir oubliés en 2021 pourquoi avoir oublié les orphelins les veuves en 2020 et 21 et pourquoi aujourd'hui à la veille des élections municipales il vient prétendre que ce gouvernement n'a pas oublié les démunis si ce n'est pas cela la, une hypocrisie politique de la pire espèce i do not know what else i could describe it as i say it again he is the expert in figures. He needs, therefore, to calculate, and his calculation will show that he owes the widows, he owes the pensioners, he owes the orphans. Move on, move on. You already made your... No, no, I, I have to conclude on another important part. And now that he has put a beautiful har in the neck of the Prime Minister to say that the Prime Minister, without him, there is nothing is he in other words saying that the reason they were forgotten was because the prime minister authorized them to be forgotten is he saying that it is the honorable prime minister praveen kumar jagnath padhamantri ji it is because of him that he forgot those vulnerable 
Oh, maybe, maybe the Prime Minister is not to be blamed, but it is only him and no one else. He should choose. He should choose. And I think the answer should be clear without any long-winded explanation, without getting lost in translation. Let me go to the other issue of a thousand rupees being given to those who are earning until up to 50,000 rupees. He is taking it from the CSJ. The Honorable Minister of Finance clearly is a product of France. In France, they started out by using the CSJ as though it was only going to be for retirement, and then they expanded its application to things which were not originally intended to cover. Therefore, whatever is good in a country, we should try to emulate. But please, in the name of the Almighty, let us try to stay away from bad practice. And the bad practice in certain jurisdictions are here clear to show us the right way. And the right way is not what the Honorable Minister of Finance is doing, because the Honorable Fi Minister of Finance is saying, I am taking money from CSJ that was originally intended for what? For retirement. But he's going to take that money and give it as allocation. And he goes around together with all the members on the other side of government, with the exception of Honorable Nazur Ali and his Honorable colleague who has just left. Because obviously, I take it that they do not share what this government shares. Clearly. He gives the impression with all those other followers that as though this 1,000 rupees is an increase in salary. Que ce soit connu à partir de ce moment, que ce, ces 1,000 rupees d'allocation, c'est précisément ce que c'est une allocation et non pas une augmentation salariale. Le ministre des Finances, l'honorable ministre, vient nous dire en introduction à la nécessité d'augmenter cette, ou donner cette allocation, que le coût de la vie a augmenté. Sur cela, il a raison. Mais je lui pose encore une autre question. Il n'était pas nécessaire, monsieur le ministre, d'attendre le budget pour venir soulager la souffrance De, 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 du peuple mauricien. Pourquoi avoir attendu le budget Je pose la question. Est-ce qu'il y avait une nécessité légale d'attendre le budget pour donner une allocation Je connais la réponse. Non, il n'y avait pas de nécessité légale. Est-ce qu'il y avait une nécessité administrative d'attendre et de faire attendre la population pour donner ce, les 1000 roupies mensuelles Non Il n'y avait pas de problème administratif. Le ministre des Finances aurait pu, il y a longtemps, plus de trois ou quatre mois ou même cinq mois, donner cette allocation. Pourquoi alors avoir attendu, si ce n'est simplement de s'acheter une virginité politique Rien d'autre. Rien d'autre. La virginité politique, clairement, la crédibilité politique que ce gouvernement n'en a plus, Le ministre des Finances se sert de stratagèmes, se sert de manœuvres que je dirais politiquement frauduleuses pour venir de l'avant, pour dire, voilà, c'est maintenant que je vais vous donner cet argent. Mais que la population le sache, ce n'est pas une augmentation salariale. Alors je pose la question, pourquoi ne pas avoir accordé Dans le mois de juin, ou plutôt, comme je l'ai dit il y a quelques minutes, une augmentation salariale à tous ceux qui touchent moins de 50 000 roupies. Si le ministre des Finances reconnaît dans son discours, que ce soit en anglais, que ce soit dans la version anglaise ou la version française, qu'il y a eu effectivement une augmentation énorme du coût de la vie, pourquoi alors ne pas donner une augmentation salariale for an increase in the basic salary, for it to be counted as an increase in remuneration. Because this allocation is not to be equated with an increase in salary. 
honorable speaker. And this is where I call it and why I call it a fraud. It is a fraud because you make people believe that they are obtaining an increase in salary. No. It is a fraud because you give them what they have put aside. This money is not something that is from the consolidated fund. It is not from the pockets of members of government. It is not from any of their pockets. It is money that workers of this country have contributed in the CSG. Therefore, it is their own money that you are trying to be generous with. How much of a fraud is it when someone essaye to se montrer généreux avec l'argent qui appartient à la personne qui l'a mis de côté, pas dans le fond, the consolidated fund. So then the question which the Honorable Minister of Finance will have to answer. What will happen in December when there has to be talks about compensation, annual compensation? What will happen? Is he saying that the cost of living is going to get better? The IMF says things will get bad. Economists say things will get bad. OECD thing says things will get bad. The World Bank says things will get bad. If things are going to get worse, the rates of interest are increasing in the States, the rates of interest increasing in Europe. The value of our currency will keep on going down. The price of commodities will keep on going up. The price of fuel will not go down. What will happen in December? Will you then ask the private sector, whom you seem so willing to protect at each and every angle and corner that you adopt, Will you ask those patrons then to come and give that 1,000 rupees as from January 2023? And if not, why not? That is the question that the Honorable Minister of Finance has to answer. If not, why not? I say that as from now, I underline it again. We believe that yes, the prices of commodities have skyrocketed. Yes. The price of fuel has not been brought down. Yes, the price of fertilizers have increased the very next day of his presentation of the budget. The very next day. So things are not in control. And when I am to speak through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Honorable Minister of Finance, I'm appealing not to his political acumen. The issue here is not of getting re-elected. The issue is about saving the country. There is a stark difference between wanting to get re-elected and saving the country. Because if you want to get re-elected, this is a, the recipe that you have shown us. Where there is, can you imagine, Mr. Speaker, let us like any child listening to me today, any student listening to me today, go to the budget speech of the Honorable Minister of Finance. Go to the English version. Go to the French version. Go control find. Control, find. Find the word productivity. You can't find it. Can you imagine a budget of the Minister of Finance after almost two years of problems because of COVID, the word productivity is not there? Can you imagine about efficiency, about production in the manufacturing sector when statistics show us that the statistics are so bad IMF says we're doing badly when it comes to exports. The minister says we're doing very well. And the minister says nothing about efficiency. Honorable Bola made a speech just now about his ministry. Did he ever come up and tell us how this government is going to address the issue of lack of productivity and efficiency? They are only concerned with trying to use money that is not theirs, pretend it's theirs, Pretend that they are the most generous of all. And then they want to make, give themselves a political virginity for an election that they don't want to give. For an election that they're scared to face. So this is the be all and end all of this government. Lack of vision. Lack of strategy. L'audacité n'avait pas. Let me put the question to the Honorable Minister of Finance. If only I had the opportunity of cross-examining him one day. This would be the day I would enjoy 
my whole career as a politician because he would be an easy witness. One thing I would like to ask him is the following. Do you think it's fair? Do you think it's fair to basically when this, and I'm here speaking about the person who leaves his home, many leave their homes and go to work four or five in the morning, fishers, gardeners, artisans, ouvriers, those who work part time. Do you think it's fair that they are victim of a regressive taxation, which is called VAT? VAT on fuel that this government refuses to reduce? Do you know that the inflationary pressure on the rise is contributed to a certain extent by the policy of this government not to bring down the price of fuel? Let us imagine the inflationary pressure, the effect of the price increase of price of fuel on this little simple man or woman going to work that earns maybe not even more than 11,000 rupees a month. Let's imagine that man, that woman, that citizen going to work and the price of increase of fuel on that person, the effect it has on that person as opposed to one of the ministers or even myself or even the members of parliament here or even you, Mr. Speaker, or even the president or even the prime minister or even the head of a private company, the CEO of one of the listed companies. Do you know the difference? The difference is for those who can afford it, they don't care that it increases because it is most probably not even them paying for the fuel. But for those who can't afford it, it means the world to them. The fact that you refuse to recognize that this has to be brought down. Why not follow the good example set in India? Why do you always talk about India as being the be all and end all of your policy? internal and external but when it comes to following good practice you turn a blind eye in doing so you turn a blind eye to the suffering of the people the little men the women of this country who cannot join les deux bouts i plead to this government to bring down the price of fuel and it follows my plea that they should also consider that this 1000 rupees even though it is insufficient, that it should also be indexed as their salary increase and not an allocation. Because when the man and woman goes to the bank at the end of the month, he wants to take a loan. He wants to take an a loan or a overdraft facility. The bank will tell him, vous n'avez pas eu d'augmentation salariale, monsieur ou madame. Ce que le gouvernement prétend est faux. Ce que le gouvernement prétend est mensonge parce qu'il n'y a pas eu. Yes? Move on, move on. Move on, move on. Move on from where? You are repeating your argument. Madame Clark, could you please read that part of the standing order not to repeat arguments? Well, I, I know standing orders before you read it. I know it better. Okay. So I will move follow on, what you say. On, I'll follow on. what you say. I'll move on. I'll say it in French now. <laughs> so what I'm saying is we need to recognize the suffering of the people. And I know that obviously standing orders, Mr. Speaker, say that I have, cannot be repetitive. I totally agree with you. But then again, if I have to repeat myself for people to understand that suffering cannot be ignored, I'm sure you will understand. I mean, I'm no, sure you will. You there's no but. 30 minutes left. I've got 30 minutes left and there's more to say. Don't worry. Anyway, so let me come now to another issue, which is corruption. The report of the PAC that is shared by Honorable Utim and all the members therein did a fantastic job. I talked about that recently in one of my interventions. The report of the Director of Audit, also a fantastic job. Why is it that, and that's another question for the Minister, why is it that this budget makes no room and no provision for any mechanism whatsoever to identify the wrongs. Not one wrong, many wrongs. The reports make reference to violation of public procurement law. The reports make reference to 
clear acts of corruption. The reports make reference to clear, purposeful absence of transparency and accountability. Why is it that the Honorable Minister of Finance, in the process of preparing this budget, that is indeed a historical one, why is it that he forgets that there is the urgent need to address those lacunas, those moquements, referred to clearly and distinctly in those two reports? Why? Why does he try to pretend that those facts do not exist? Why is he ignoring the mess that exists in the Ministry of Health? Why is he ignoring the reports and the fingers of blame pointing at the Ministry of Health and those administering that ministry and officers within that ministry when it comes to procurement? Why does he ignore it? Why does he turn a blind eye to that? Why is it that he refuses to recognize that this government is losing the fight against corruption, but nay, is even helping to further the fight against corruption? Oh, not the fight, but the defeat against corruption. This is what this government is furthering us into. Why is it that he didn't even try to address this issue? My friends who addressed this August Assembly before me, Honorable Yutim, talked about the whole issue about torture. Was it so difficult for the Prime Minister, who, since everything goes through him, to at least ask the Minister of Finance, you know, let's put a paragraph there, at least a few lines, to recognize that we need to ensure that violence by certain police officers is nothing more than what is localized as we already know. Let us ensure that it is not only the tip of the iceberg. Let us embark upon measures and tools and equipment that will protect not only the police officer against false accusations, but the victims, citizens against abuse by police officers. Body cameras. True it is that the safety camera, the safe city camera itself never worked. And it, 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 it has sections of the films deleted coincidentally or otherwise god knows when it comes to finding murder victims murder uh, uh, those who committed murder in the kistan case and other cases all of a sudden reels and reels of video and times are just absent but why is it that the government cannot even consider that they have to address this issue about torture what the minister talked about is the police academy it reminds me of the serial Police Academy 1, 2, and 3 in the 80s. <laughs> because they're just made with a bunch of jokers. This is what he wants? This is how you address torture? Look at the image we have outside of Mauritius. The press, international press, talking about torture in our police stations. And the international press will now talk about what? The inability of this government to recognize that there is a problem? The inability to find solutions or the refusal? Or is it that they are doing it on purpose? Because they need to ensure that their dominance goes on and the fear in the people goes on. That is why they do not want to have the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. Lame excuses on the part of the Attorney General. Why is it that we don't have it? Is it because they want, we want to continue with having political victims of the police? Is that it? Arrest people and then pretend to inquire? Because Lord so now, this is why? I know that very often when, I'm sure the Honorable Minister of Finance, Mr. Speaker, will recognize, but that when Shakespeare says something is rotten in the state of Denmark, I'm sure that he can smell the rot in Mauritius right now. And it is on his side of the house. Let me say that, on his side of the house. Is it fair to ask someone to pay the same price for fuel à la pompe? Qui n'a même pas plus que 10 000 roupies par mois, il doit aller travailler. Il va payer le prix. 
que le même prix que vous, les ministres, nous, les députés, les, les PDG des sociétés privées, is that normal? Is it normal that we pay the same price? We pay, and I would like him to answer that. Is it fair that we pay the same price for one, one bourbon gas? They love to regurgitate. We put on the subsidy, we put on the subsidy, but you're subsidizing the rich as well. You're subsidizing the millionaires. You are asking them to pay the same price for gas as the poor. Is this fair? You will say, but when you were in government, you did the same thing. But when we were in government, we did not live through the crisis that we're living through now. We have not seen this level of indebtedness that this country is now living through. We have not known it. Therefore, therefore, it is urgent for us to be able to think en dehors du boîte, as my honorable friend Lomesh Bandu used to say. <laughs> it is important to think outside of the box, come up with measures that are daring and not only for your political survival. The difference between a politician and a leader, choose to be a leader and not a politician. Mr. Speaker, sir, he says he wants to protect the he wants to protect the employees. He says, empty slogan, vide de sens, ou maybe il ne connaît même pas le sens de ce qu'il dit. With the people, for the people. I'm going to demonstrate now, again, why I believe that he does not say what he believes, or maybe he doesn't understand what he says. With the people, the director of audits report Page 344 and 345. Maybe the Honorable Minister of Finance n'est pas vraiment concerné parce qu'il y a dans le rapport du directeur de l'audit. À la note 29.2, pension funds. 72 public sector body rec bodies record deficits totaling 33.3 billion. I quote. At paragraph 24.2 of my audit report for the financial year 2019-2020, I pointed out that the financial statements of 63 public sector bodies submitted to the National Audit Office showed that pension funds under their defined benefits pension plans were running deficits totaling 26 billion as at 30th of June 2019. A follow-up exercise was carried out based on financial statements submitted as at the 30th of June 2020 to my office. The financial statements of 72 public sector bodies as at the 30th of June 2020 showed an aggregate deficit of 33.3 billion rupees. The Minister of Finance, Mr. Speaker, says with the people, for the people. Were you with the people when you ignored this in 2020? I wasn't Minister of Finance. It wasn't Honorable Lezonga. It wasn't Honorable Ganu. It was, Mr. Speaker, the same, the very, the one and only Honorable Padachi. He was the one Minister of Finance. And he was being congratulated by the Honorable Prime Minister. And, and then, once again, he regurgitated that without Praveen Kumar Jagnath, I am nothing and I cannot think without him and with him and only him that we can have a budget. Was it the Prime Minister who asked you to ignore this fund's 33.3 billion rupees deficit? Whose money is this? The money of the workers. And what is it? Define benefit pension plans? Central Water Authority, maybe Honorable Ganu will have to respond. Two billion rupees of deficit in the pension plan fund. Rezonga, sorry, I do apologize. We'll get to you later. <laughs> Mauritius Revenue Authority, two billion. Mauritius Broadcasting Corporation, almost a billion. Mauritius Institute of Education, almost a billion. Mauritius Private Secondary Education Authority. <laughs> Wow, 6.5 6 billion almost. 
local authorities, the Minister of Local Government maybe will enlighten us. The local authorities have more than 4 billion rupees of deficit in the plan, the pension plan. 4 billion rupees of deficit. A total of 33.3 billion rupees of deficit. One simple question I ask once again the Honorable Minister of Finance. If you are serious in what you say, that it is all for the people, that it is all with the people, why did you choose to keep this under the rug, brush it under the carpet and keep it silent and not even address it, not even in your annexes, not even in your speech, not even in the French version, not even in the English version, let alone your interview that you gave at the TV in Atle Express and all the other media, you kept silent. Why? Why? Who cares? Who cares? Because slogans are more important, Mr. Speaker, sir, with the people, for the people. But I will not say anything about the budget that's deficit déficitaire. Oh, mais je vais rester tranquille parce que si je reste tranquille, ils ne vont pas savoir. Parce que si je parle trop, ils vont poser des questions. Et s'ils posent des questions, la vérité va triompher. Et si la vérité triomphe, le gouvernement va subir une défaite. N'est-ce pas? So I hope I have a repartie beaucoup plus intelligent qu'un hum. Anyway, so, Mr. Speaker, sir, let me say, while I listen to Honorable Attorney General talk about, you will notice that the Honorable Attorney General, Minister of Agro-Industry, never even responded, rebutted the previous orator. He could not even rebut Honorable Utim in what he said. He chose to be supposedly the one who stays above the fray. He is paid by taxpayers' money. He is paid by taxpayers' money. He is accountable to this house. When Honorable Utim says what he says, he says it with reason. After having studied it, after having come up with a responsible speech, Honorable Utim was totally entitled to make his remarks. The least the people expect is an Attorney General, Minister of the Republic of Agro-Industry, to respond to the criticisms. C'est ça la transparence, c'est ça la démocratie, et c'est pour cette raison qu'aujourd'hui, la majorité des jeunes de ce pays ne voient pas d'un bon oeil la direction que ce pays a pris depuis 2017. Les choses se sont empirées. But let me say to him, when you look at the budget of the Honorable Minister of Finance, once again, it is typical of the Honorable Minister of Finance. He flip-flops around. He flip-flops with measures, and his flip-flop measure in the field of agro-industry is even more totally flopped. Because at least when I look at Rwanda, when I look at Rwanda, that Honorable Duty makes reference to, they are moving clearly from the primary sector of employment to the secondary sector of employment, and have brought in the tertiary sector of employment, and even brought in the fourth sector of employment, which Honorable Balgobin Unfortunately, he's not here. The statistics of this country don't even make reference to the quarterly sector of employment, which covers computing and ICT and research and development. This is how backwards we are compared to Rwanda. Shame on this government, not on any minister. I don't want to be thrown out. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, let me now address the qualms of Honorable Deputy Speaker, who made some remarks. I have listened very carefully to the Honorable Minister Kunjusha make in a press conference that happened during the weekend. And I think it's important to put things in context. I totally agree with the views of my Honorable Friend Nazwali, who says that the civil code already provides for the recognition of a, of a religious marriage. It's always there. And the reason it was there, ever back since 1982, 
since 1982, because this is when it was brought in 1981, I apologize, 1981. It was when Sersiusaga Ramgulam brought it into the civil code following a promise that he had made to late Sir Abdul Razak Mohammed at the time of the elections for independence. It took the time that it took, but the promise was kept by Sir Siusaga Ramgulam in 1981. It was blown away in 1987 by Sir Anirudh Jagnat. It was blown to smithereens in 1987. I remember Honorable Ganu making speeches, and he himself was on the right side of the house when he criticized the wrong move of 1987. But then, in 1991, the MMM was in government, if memory serves me correctly, and things were brought right. The MMM could make the MSM see straight. Then, now we come up with myself, Honorable Mohamed, Osman Mohamed, myself and other members, many times who put questions. In 2014, in 2014, the law was amended to allow those who were late to register and to benefit from the mistake and blunder of Sir Anirudh Jagnat MSM government in 1987. The law was amended by way of regulations. And then we come to today. But before we come to today, many times we put questions. When we put questions, the only one who was sympathetic to it was from the question of Honorable Osman Mohamed, who was the Honorable Minister of Finance presently. But Honorable Gayan, Honorable Sina Tambu, ministers of the, 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 the previous MSM government until 2019, were totally refractory and said, no way. We will refuse to correct the mistake committed in 1987. And those on the other side, some of them know what I'm talking about. But now, when you look at what Honorable Kunjusa has said, because before we get there, maybe a minister of the Republic who is not even aware what the law says today is dangerous, in fact. So that is why... I am quite confused. No, sorry, I do apologize. The government is confused because the position that is adopted by Honorable Kunjusha is as follows. I read what is reported and what she said. Lorsqu'un homme marié, I quote, peu importe de quelle communauté, décède, son épouse percevra une pension de 9000 roupies. Now, she doesn't deserve a medal there because that's the law. She's not nothing, nothing, new, nothing new. But she goes on to say, s'il y en a des madames, Pas des madames qui pour gagner 9000 saken. Cette somme sera ensuite divisée entre les deux veuves. Garde ça bien en tête qui a aujourd'hui, grâce à sa mesure là, nous in alcorise et l'injustice incroyable contre sa bonne madame là. But what she fails to understand is l'injustice, l'injustice that she makes reference to was en 1987 par Sani Rodjagnan, Prime Minister. What she fails to do, you see, because, you see, Maybe she's given a speech to read and she doesn't even know the facts and the, the, the intricacies of it. Les tenants et les aboutissants. So she doesn't know history. The reason why the Muslim Family Council came into being and it was corrected in 1991, MMM was in power. That is the reason, reason. I always have to say that is the truth. So when she says now that une pension de 9000 roupies, s'il y a trois femmes qui sont mariées religieusement à un homme, va être divisée en trois, but she doesn't know what the law says. The law says that in the civil code, in the Civil Status Act, which is law today, all women married religiously or civilly are considered to be married. As long as for the religious one, it is registered at the Muslim Family Council. Simple. So every single person in Mauritius who have an a simple notion of what reading the law is about knows what the law is. There is no issue there. So what the Honorable Minister Kunjusha has done is take the situation of the law today, which entitles every single woman who is married religiously. If a man is married to four, he has four religious wives. They are all four entitled to pension of 9,000 rupees each. That is the law today. And this is not, she seems not even to be aware of. And that is why I am saying that there seems to be a total mess in the government because Honorable Nazur Ali is totally right when it comes to his interpretation of things. He's a lawyer, he knows. But the Honorable 
Minister Kunjusa, being a minister, I presume, should have advisors. I take it that she is not the minister responsible for the issue. But if what she is saying becomes truth, then there is no, nothing that is being corrected. In fact, it is being made worse. So I think that as the English language says, they should stop getting their knickers in a twist and try to come up with a bloody solution when it comes to what the reality of the law is today and not basically say anything that comes from the top of their head simply to cow and bow to extremist right movement that have a problem with the quality of the law. The difference between Sir Sagar Ramgulam, who in 1981 understood and implemented as opposed to what the mess and the confusion in government today is stark. C'est ça la différence entre le Parti Travailliste et le MSM. Le Parti Travailliste avait promis la communauté musulmane, loin à l'époque de, de, des discussions de l'indépendance, de Antia Sissagar Amgoulam et Sabdou Razak Mohamed, que this would be fact in our civil law. It was brought in, out in, in our civil law in 1981, after the death of Sabdou Razak Mohamed. But today, Honorable Kunjusa wants to take us back before, at the, even the, before the time of colonial days. This would not be correcting wrong. It would be bringing us to another epoch. So I am convinced, therefore, Mr. Speaker, sir, when I listen to Honorable Minister Kunjusha, that her words are dangerous. Her, her words are devoid of any logic. And for a minister of the Republic to have said what she has said, it was an insult to our law as it stands today. And that is the danger. And I am of the humble view that the Prime Minister should call her to order. It is not a question about going to make certain right, extreme right movement happy. Because, and then she's going to just try to hatch something that comes out. And I don't mean egg and omelet here. I just mean she hatched an idea. It's, just, it's not the point. On ne peut pas perpétuellement être une boîte de savon. One has to know when one is going to open one's mouth what the law is and not speak nonsense. That is what the responsibility of a minister is. And the responsibility of a prime minister is very simple. To ensure that the continuity of the law. The law is that religious marriages are recognized, full stop. And all those widows they have been disappearing, but you do know how many of them have not been paid les arrières de pension? And you are saying as a government that you're going to come and correct a wrong, a wrong committed by the MSM itself, but this government today has a minister that wants to take us to the time pre-independence. Courage aux backbenchers qui ont eu le, le toupé au moins et l'intelligence de se prononcer contre ce qu'elle a dit. Mais ce qui est grave, c'est que this government refuses to recognize that all those widows and their children that have grown up without being paid this Jew, their Jew, there's a hiérage that is due to them. If I am to listen to the Honorable Minister Kunjusha, those women are not equal, don't have equal rights. Those women are not to be recognized. And let me finish on the speech that was given in South Africa by Mahatma Gandhi when he was a young lawyer fighting against British colonialism. At a time when the British colonialists refused to recognize Hindu religious marriages, Muslim religious marriages, he stood up in a gathering and said, we our women and our sisters cannot be considered as concubines. We married them religiously and they are to be recognized as our wives. More respect is due to our mothers and our sisters. And what the Honorable Minister Kunjusha has done, I hope she's brought to order and it is nothing else and nothing less than her resignation that would be something that has been offered and she has to leave as Minister. Thank you very much.